Welcome to another edition of Rick and Bubba University, the podcast. Bubba, I know that you are drawn back like a flip right now, and you can't stand it. I mean, uh, excitement is all through the studio today because we're going to talk space launch system engineering and solid rocket booster project. Rick, it doesn't get any better than this for me. I've been a fan of space and rocket since I was a little bitty kid, uh, ever since I borrowed uh, my mother's aluminum foil right before Thanksgiving to put on the lunar module I was building in the basement. Yes. Uh, it's a Thanksgiving I never forgot. But my love for the space program continued, even though I got my hiney tore up pretty bad on that one. Well, every time a rocket launches, your rear end hurts. But other than that, <laughs> uh, it's uh, – Bubby, you were telling me about the SLS program. And, uh, and, and you know, because we went through the whole shuttle uh, era and, right. and all that. And I remember you saying we, we need to get back to, to a former design. And uh, we have the man to tell us all about it today, Director for Engineering and Integration for the SLS program. Let's put our hands together and welcome David Beeman. David, thank you for being here. Well, thanks for letting me come. You know, I, I'm like you. I grew up on the space program, and it, it excites me every day to get up and go to work. You know? now, you know, you're, you're from a family of people who have worked in the space program. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so, so my dad was fortunate enough to go to work for NASA in 1961, the year I was born. Um, he worked on the Apollo program. He worked with the Von Braun team. And um, I got to experience laying on the side of the road watching Apollo 11 launch, going to the moon. Wow. And, and I got to experience the... I guess the understanding of why we were doing it, you know, why do we do such things? Why do we spend so much money on developing things like this? And, and what does that development do for us as a country and as people? You know, the Apollo project, which I think to date has to be the greatest thing mankind has ever accomplished because since God rested on the seventh day, Men and women have looked up at the moon and thought, what, what's it made of? You know, what it, would it be like to be there? And then we saw that happen in our lifetime. And your dad had a big part of that. Uh, it's such an, a, you know, accomplishment in the technology and engineering and the spinoffs that it gave us. And this is, David, this is one of the things that I, I get sideways with people on. There's nothing more than I love seeing somebody on TV criticizing money on the space program while they're being interviewed on a cable channel holding a cell phone. It just, it, you know, and headed home to, to play with uh, online with all their laptops. So, I mean, the fact that we had a challenge and we did it, all these things have paid so big dividends. I mean, it's carried us from... You know the party line to the to the uh, to the smartphone and beyond, and this this program is going to do the same for us. It does. So what I tell people is, trying to do the imaginable opens up your imagination, right? What if we listen to people that said we can't do something? What would we do? Sit at home? You know, it amazes me. I think about our desire to explore, and it's not just about the exploration, but that's the desire that drives us to do things like this, and. And if you look at the benefits to humans, look at the medical breakthroughs, you know, look at all the science that we have, look at the cell phones that you can't ask industry to do those kind of break, breakthroughs. Um, there's too many failures and, and failure's not bad. That, that's another thing people understand. You know, you think back listening to people, failure's not an option. To me, I never learned anything when I had a success. I confirmed a whole lot. But I learned something when I failed, and I took that, and it drove me to go do more. You know, we, we went to the, to the moon. Uh, we went through Apollo 17. The last few missions were canceled. Um, they did a wonderful job, but then they kind of threw the keys to the next generation and said it'll be up to you guys to do what you're going to do. And the, the programs we've had since then had their place. The space shuttle was the most complicated machine ever built. But, boy, the margins were close. They were really close, and I was fortunate enough to work that program. I managed the booster element for the space shuttle program, um, and I was on the mission management team for the last 22 launches of the shuttle. And um, it was. We were right on the ragged edge. But that's what technology is about. Um, if you're trying to do something that's really tough, you know, cheating gravity is tough. Yes, it is. So if you're trying to <laughs> it do something. It fights back, doesn't it? it? It really <laughs> does, and we experienced some of that. And so what we have to do as leaders in a program like that is put ourselves in the best position. We can't get rid of all the risks, but we right. can mitigate and manage them, and that's our job. 
Well, the uh, the space shuttle served us well. It did what it was designed to do, and that is build things in low Earth orbit. And as wonderful as that is, and I've met several astronauts who were on the International Space Station, and it, I can't imagine what it would be like seeing that sunrise come up and go down so many times in a day and see Earth from that view. But there's something about go west, young man. We just got to get out there and go uh, you know, that's another thing. Anybody being critical, standing in America of people wanting to explore, it's, you know, I, I've got a problem with that. But w- we got to go. It's what we're made of. We see things. We look. We ask questions. We got to go. That's our nature. That's the very soul of our civilization. And I'm glad we live in a country that we have the technical ability to do that. And I'm and I. I think a lot of people are glad to be back on top of a ballistic missile for this because it's just uh, it, it has a lot of positives. And tell us a little bit about Space Launch System and how this is going to be the platform going forward for exploring the moon and beyond. Okay, so the Space Launch System will be the most powerful rocket that's ever flown. It generates about 8.8 million pounds of thrust. That's 15 percent more than Saturn V did, and and so and so it allows us. It puts us in a position to where we can go deeper into space and and we can demonstrate things that will allow us to go deeper. So the first mission, we're going to fly to the moon. We're going to spend about 40 to 42 days in, in uh, flight. We're going to demonstrate our systems that we're going to use for the deep space exploration. You know, I tell people it's kind of akin to you got a five ton truck and you got to go haul a ton of sand, right? You don't just get in the truck and go. You ask yourself, where are we going? How far is it? How many times do I have to fuel? Right. How many drivers do I need? The operational aspects are just as important as the rocket. But this rocket is amazing. This is America's rocket, uh, and I'm pleased to be a part of it. And, and so it's going to enable us to take things in large chunks deep in space and use them. Um, that doesn't downplay the importance of the other rockets that we have, whether right. they're commercial or whatever. It's just, you know. Working in space is tough. You want to carry something in its final form, not have to assemble it up there. And this rocket is going to enable us to do that. Well, I think when you have a private and public uh, partnership, it's it, we always come out ahead because there's some things that are just too big for the private sector that takes government to do, mm-hmm. like this rocket. And there's some things that I think uh, private industry gets so innovative and trying to do new things that really the government can't take time to, to, to do the risk of. And I think you're seeing the best of both worlds right now with the private folks that are doing low earth orbit things. And then what we're going to see with this, I, I think it's, it's a good time to be a space fan. It is. And, and what people don't realize is we, the government, we're, we're not in the profit business, right? So we're trying to get something and get it into a state where we can use it. And then we'll turn it over to industry and let industry use it. Look at all the technologies we've turned over to industry. We don't sell them. We give them because we work for the U.S. government. We work for the people of this country. And our goal is to develop something that will benefit our way of life in the future. I know, Rick, do we need to take a break here before we get into that? Yeah, because yeah, I want to yeah, and I want to say one thing before we go to the break. And I've sat here and I've tried to be quiet about it. <laughs> I'm sorry, Rick. No, <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm playing my role. But, but I thought you guys would say something to America about a benefit of the space program that you've just overlooked, and that's Velcro. I mean, where, <laughs> yeah. where, where, oh, yeah. where would we have been without Velcro? And, uh, and is, did the space program get credit for that, or has that been oversold? Well, uh, you know, I've, I've heard a lot of different stories on that. Right. And so yeah. what I'll tell you is I've heard yes and I've heard no. I don't know the real answer. Okay. <laughs> I do know overall from technology we've put more things into America's hands no, no doubt than you that. can imagine. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we will. We'll come back and, and we'll kind of jump in. I mean, Bubba, we're about to put this thing. I mean, we're, we're about to launch. I know. We're I mean, hopefully at the end of the month. So we'll we'll see how it goes. But we got to know all about it before I mean, we get oh, it, before Bubba, we get it on the we, pad we, ready yes, to go. That's right. right. There, that, we we have to leave no 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 rocket uh, part unturned. <laughs> that's right. So we'll do that. We'll dive right in when we come back on this edition of Rick and Bubba University, the podcast. This is the Rick and Bubba Show. Watch more at blazetv.com slash Rick and Bubba. Rick and Bubba, Rick and Bubba. All right, we're back on Rick and Bubba University, the podcast. Uh, David Beeman is with us, uh, the SLS program, uh, and he's managing the system. He's the systems engineering and integration manager. Bubba, he's right in it. He's been in the space program for a long time, generationally. 
and we're getting ready for the uh, the launch of the SLS program. That's right. Coming up at the end of the month, hopefully we'll be the first test flight going to go around the moon to begin with. Mm-hmm. Unmanned, but we're going to dial it in and then be ready for astronauts after that. David, tell us a little bit. A lot of us that grew up with Apollo knew how that rocket was put together. And with the SLS system, we're taking some parts from the space shuttle that worked and were reliable and upgraded them and added some new things with it to give us our most powerful rocket to date. We have. So, you know, the Saturn V was an amazing development program because it had never been done before. Right. Um, when, we, when we started developing SLS, um, we tried to base it on the pedigree of stuff that we already had. We had assets that were from the retired shuttle program. We wanted to be able to use them. When we use them, that's a benefit from a cost standpoint to the government and, and, and to our, you know, our taxpayers. No need to reinvent right? the wheel. No, no sure. need to. So with that said, we took a four-segment solid rocket booster, and I told, told you that I managed that element for the shuttle. We added another segment to it, which gives us additional thrust, makes it burn a little bit longer. Um, we upgraded <clears throat> some materials on that. We took the space shuttle main engines, which now we call the RS-25. We used those on the core stage. We also took the Delta IV heavy upper stage and modified it. So that allowed us to take technology where we didn't have to put a lot of money into the development, utilize it, and in parallel, as we're using those assets, we're developing the next generation, which is what we call Block 1B. And what that will allow us to do is to have a new upper stage to go deeper into space. And so it's really neat to me how we took the things that we had. We said we can use these things. And then we developed the things as we use that inventory up to be able to look to the future. David, the Apollo rocket had three stages. Um, talk to us here. Will we need three stages with the boosters, or how is all that going to stack it's a, together it's and a come apart? It's a little bit different, and you can see the model yeah. over here. These are the solids, mm-hmm. okay? So we're and, accustomed to seeing with the space shuttle. Yeah. We were accustomed to seeing that. So they fly for about 2 minutes and 11 seconds, and then they break off and fall back into the ocean. During the shuttle, we recovered those. We're not recovering them now. We're using all of what I'd say the oomph or, or the kick of the boosters and not having to have that additional mass in there for the recovery system. Then you have the core stage, which is the major stage, the first stage, and it flies actually past when the boosters fly, and it flies up till about eight minutes. It has four of the RS-25 engines on the aft end, and then you have the upper stage, which is what we call the ICPS or interim cryogenic propulsion stage, and it's a modified upper stage that we got from for United Launch Alliance partnered with Boeing. And so um, it's pretty amazing because really what you try to do is as you fly a particular stage and all of its propellant goes away, you want to get rid of that parasitic weight so you're not carrying it anymore and then let the next stage take over, drop that off, and fly the ne- next stage. And so we have a very reliable uh, set of te- technology in this. We've flown it. We've flown it over and over again. And so that, that's what we're taking advantage of. And then on top, we have a new redesigned capsule. We used to call it a command module, but what, what are we calling it now? There, we've got some new names. Well, actually, right? you've got two pieces to it. Okay, you've got the service module, mm-hmm. which is the propulsive stage, and it's, it's right here. Right. And then you have the Orion capsule, which sits on top of that. And it's actually similar to the way we had it back then, but they called it a command module versus a service module, and it's a little bit different. Now, the command module is provided by our partners of the service module, European Space Agency. So this is an international partnership. When I talk about it being America's rocket, we, um, we have parts and pieces and work that's going on in 45 out of the 50 states, and then we have four other countries that work jointly with us to develop. So this rocket, when it's functional with a crew, will be capable of reaching the moon again? Absolutely. In fact, this rocket's going to the moon in a couple of weeks. Right, we won't have people on it. We actually have nothing um, wrong dummies. with te- nothing wrong with the test run. So there, David, there, you know? <laughs> there, there's dummies. That you mean you don't mean people that we don't need? <laughs> no, right, right. You no, need equipment I mean, like because uh, I was I was going to put a few members of Congress in it. But <laughs> the uh, but, but no, what 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 I'm what I'm saying is so the dummies are there. What just to kind of give us? Have you got sensors? They're and instrumented. Stuff on? They're yeah, instrumented. Yeah, right, okay. the, the whole idea is we want this this to be just like humans were on it. Right. We don't have all of the environmental equipment inside there operating because you don't have to provide oxygen and all that. But you want to test your systems out, and the best way to test your systems out is have, have instrumentation, um, get the data, and when the 
when the uh, Orion capsule comes back, we're going to gather that data and look at it and assure ourselves that we're ready to commit the next flight to the moon. The Orion capsule will come in like the Apollo capsule. It'll have to do a reentry burn and land in the ocean. Yes, right? and it's going to come in a whole lot hotter and faster than what we did back in shuttle days. It's going to be coming in at about Mach 32 or 32 times the speed of sound. We were at about Mach 24, 25 with the space shuttle. Um, so it's going to come back in. That will allow us to test the thermal system on that, which will protect the astronauts. And so we've got sensors embedded in that. We'll be able to to recover the capsule, look at it, make sure that it's performed the way it should performed, and right. that we feel comfortable putting the next man, woman, and person of color uh, in space. No S turns on this one. and She's coming in hot. <laughs> she's coming in. <laughs> so and what you're trying to find out with these dummies in there is can we come in that at th- that rate well, and still be well, okay? Just the whole test. Yeah. Just the whole test, yeah. And theoretically, you could just put the sensors in there, but didn't it a whole lot better to embed the sensors in a yeah. mannequin and yeah. put them in oh, the yeah. seat? And and it's just you're like you're going to be. It's you just overall cooler, too. Yeah. And yeah. the Orion will carry – you can get more astronauts in it. You can get up, up to four, right? right? And so that's that's really important. And we'll make a decision of whether we're flying with three or four, depending on what payload and cargoes we're carrying, things like that. David, if I understand the concept for going back to the moon is we're actually going to put a gateway or a space station in orbit around the moon? Is that, that, is that the yeah. plan still? We have a program called Gateway. And the whole intent, um, as you want to go deeper in space, you're going to have to stage. You right. can't just go and fly straight to Mars. So what you're going to have to do is build a staging place, a position that you can go, that you can house the astronauts, that you can um, develop materials, that you can grow plants, all those different things. And so Gateway is our program that's going to allow us to put what's similar to a space station in orbit around the moon. And that would serve a staging place. We would fly to it. Then we would stage from there down to the moon or to other planets. So the lander that will go to the moon, will it stay on the gateway and be reused, or will we carry it with us every time like we did with Apollo? Well, we have, we have a, a program for that, and, and we were looking at the, the different aspects of that. You know, are we going to use reusable stuff? We've let several contracts for companies to go off and to develop landers. Right, right. And so I think a lot of that will be driven by the technology and the testing, and do we prove reusability, you know? The goal would be to have something that can transport back and forth more than one time that you can refuel, you know, that type of thing. Um, because we used, you know, when we used the the uh, module to land on the moon back in the 60s, it went down, it came up, and then we got rid of it, right? Right, right. And so we'd like anything like that that you can reuse, you, want, you don't want to have to carry – the same thing every time to space. That's yeah. you kind of want that lander to be like a spider that just goes down, comes up. That just is very reliable. It would be nice to have that. Absolutely. Yeah. And you said you're gonna because you got to develop a way to to have enough food to 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 stay up there if you're gonna do something to the next stage. Did you say you're trying to come up with ways to actually grow? Oh yeah, we grow what? stuff on the space station right now. We're yeah, gonna do yeah. the same kind of thing. There's no chance we can grow anything down there on the moon. Is that I mean? It, well, it, it, not actually with the moon dirt, but what you do yeah. is you, you would have part of Build your some, your orbiting gateway yeah. outfitted with the ability to do that you would potentially build an outpost on the moon to do a similar type thing. that's what i was thinking i know you yeah. said we're gonna we're gonna have like a space station type yeah. deal that'll actually be orbiting but will we ever try to get on the actual surface and build something there yeah absolutely the The whole goal is you would you want to occupy yeah the area right. you would want to use the in situ resources that you have down there to potentially make your rocket fuel right you know we've got we've got what they call, you know, frozen liquid water, whatever you want to call it, you know, on the moon, we want to be able to take that. Well, that's hydrogen and oxygen, right? Well, hydrogen's our fuel. Oxygen's our oxidizer. So if we can use those resources there, we have the opportunity to create the fuel to go on the next leg of the mission. David, you, you mentioned something a minute ago, and, and you may not know this. This may be out of, of your area of expertise, but if we had oxygen, if we had the the covering, can you grow stuff in the moon dirt, or is it just do not does it not have the nutrients we need, or could you fertilize it into a situation it would produce? You know, I honestly don't know the answer to that. You know, I do. I am a good old country boy. I have a garden. Yeah, and, and I all know that. that's out of your yeah. area, but, yeah. it, but you brought that up, and I thought, you know, I'd never really thought about that. What can I we tell use you is, that dirt or not? We're going to try to use all the resources right. that we can. So I assume there will be some some test and evaluation and everything on that. 
But the bottom line is whatever we can't produce or use up there, we're going to have to carry with us, right? right so right. everything we can use that's natural to that environment is a benefit to us. Well, you think about it. I mean, it's this thing that popped into my head, and I know that's got everybody on the edge of their seat on, on this topic. <laughs> but, but when you look at what the Israelis were able to do in the desert, and how they were able to get way ahead of everybody else on irrigation and and food and 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 what they've been able to pull off in an area that wasn't really that cohesive to what they've accomplished. I mean, we there's some brilliant minds that have come up with ways to come up with food and some of the uh, in some pretty difficult situations. So did, did we did we bring? I know we brought rocks back from the moon. Certainly, we have soil samples yes, we brought we back. So you can you can get in there and start looking at that, seeing what's in it, uh, dealing with it, even what we have here on the earth, right? Yeah, and we've done a lot of that. It's like yeah. I said, making the unimaginable imaginable. Right, yeah. You know, you take those things and you try to do something with it, and you're going to fail a whole lot. That's yeah, okay. sure. As long as you learn something. That's it's right. It's not a failure, right? That's exactly right. <laughs> David, when we uh, – do we need to break No, you got, you got about I'm, two I'm trying to watch no, Rick. Got, no, you got about two more um, minutes. Because I know I'm going to get long-winded on some of these. Well, things. we can do something. If you got just one little short thing, then we'll break and okay. come back for a long thing. David, we're, we're headed back to the moon uh, as a first step. Mars is the goal. Can we go to Mars in that rocket? Absolutely. Absolutely. What I, what I tell folks now, is it going to take other things to go with it? Absolutely. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to come up with the lander, the transport. Right. Um, this is enabling technology. Okay. Um, can we do it by ourselves? No, we have a partnership that we have set up, and that's the way we've structured these programs. Mm-hmm. And each one of those partners has to bring their part to the table, right? So it's not all about SLS. It's not all about SpaceX. It's not all, all about Blue Origin. It's about us as a team trying to accomplish a goal. Um, you know, the weakest link can cause you to fail. So we all need to, we all need to deliver the things that we're committed to deliver. And we're committed to deliver the space launch system. As far as a capsule in space, would there be enough room for that kind of trip, or would you need some other living arrangement for a, that that length of a trip? So I would think you would have to have some type of li- other living arrangement, right. which is really like a transport vehicle, right? right? Um, but remember, this capsule is to get get them up and down, right? Right. The gateway is to establish the stopping point, mm-hmm. and then we're going to have other vehicles and other capabilities that we're going to use to transport. Um, all of that partnered with industry. Yeah, it's, it's to me, it's a lot like with our military jets. We don't take jets off in Maryland and expect them to go to you know to the far ends of the earth. We have to, you know, we have refueling tankers and yep. we have this and that. And, you know, it's it's a process. You have to get there and build a path, so to speak. Yeah, and we've been at war before and everybody had to say, all right, now we got to find some way to get there and get back. <laughs> and we need a you know, spot because, on the way because to take a break. The distance and we're going to have to refuel somewhere and, <laughs> you know, and all that. So same process, I would think. It we're is. just going further. Uh, we'll be back. We'll continue our conversation uh, with David Beeman as we discuss the next step and space exploration on this edition of Rick and Bubba University, the podcast. All right, so Bubba, we're, we're trying to, to have this conversation and, and get things, you know, in, in a way that we all can understand it and simplify some very complicated things. Um, life insurance, in, in our humble opinion, has been overcomplicated. I mean, people try to come up with all this whole life stuff, and you do this, and some kind of college fund over here, and, you know, you can pull this out if you want to. You really get down to the point you're like, you know what? I'd like to know that if I die before my family, this is the amount of money they're going to get. That's right. Period. So security. And Period. We, we want to know what it is right. and know it's going to be there. And I, and here's another thing. I You know, you and I are aging, and you start talking to people about life insurance now. They're not near as excited as they were when we were in our 20s. Uh, and, and, and <laughs> so, right. I mean, you know, in the twenties, they give you all you want. But yeah, I mean, right. but I mean now, They're giving me a second look yeah, now. Yeah, I tell you, yeah. Size once, envelope, yeah. <laughs> but here, here, but, but that's why we need ladder. Ladder has resolved this. They have simplified life insurance, and they've also made it available. Now you're gonna. When I say this, this is enough to get you to go to ladderlife.com slash Rick Bubba right now. Do you need life insurance? Are you like us? Maybe you had some when you were younger. And, and now you've aged out, and, and everybody's looking at you like, you got to be kidding me, coming here wanting life insurance. Listen to this. If you are applying for $3 million in coverage or less, no doctor, no needles, no paperwork, when you apply, it's all digital. 
Uh, they, they're going to ask you some you know, questions about your health and their application. It takes just a few minutes on a phone or a laptop to apply. Ladder's smart algorithms will then work in real time, and they're going to find out if you're instantly approved. So that's another process that's really simplified. No hidden fees. Cancel anytime you want. Get a full refund if you change your mind in the first 30 days. They've got an A-plus rating on AM Best. So 4.5 out of 8 stars on Trustpilot. They've made Forbes' best life insurance list in 2021. So finally, since life insurance costs you know more as you age, now's the time to cross this off the list. So go now. Ladder, L-A-D-D-E-R life.com slash Rick Bubba. That's ladderlife.com slash Rick Bubba. Bubba, we're back. David Beeman's here, Director of Engineering and Integration for the SLS program. Uh, we are launching a rocket at the end of this month, and we're here to discuss what's going to happen. David, I was fortunate enough to see a shuttle launch. Never got to see the Saturn V go up, but I did see a shuttle launch. And I tell people... You know, when you go to a big-time football game and you're there, uh, you tell people, you know, it's good to see it on TV if you can't be there, but it ain't like being there. It's a whole nother mm-hmm. thing. And I will say seeing the shuttle go up, and I've, I've told people publicly and privately yeah. this, I said with the exception of my children being born, I, it had to be the most marvelous thing I've ever seen. It is just rocks your senses on what's happening. It, it does. Um, I was fortunate enough to see a lot, a lot of them live. Um, and what I'll tell you is you can't imagine it until you experience it. You know, it's, it's like nothing else you've ever experienced. And to me, to be able to do that, you know, I'm blessed to do what I do. Um, I'm surrounded by a lot of smart people. Um, so to experience something like that, something that a lot of people don't get to see, I feel blessed to, to have been able to do more than one for sure. You know, I and I talk about it on the air. I think, uh, you know, money always becomes an issue with anything. Mm-hmm. But I really, and while NASA is so good at doing what you're doing, you know, there's other, you know, Disney's good at marketing. Okay, you know, everybody's got their cup of tea they're really good at. I, I wish they would build a horseshoe stadium down there that sits about 80 grand. Make notes for the boss. Uh, that <laughs> sell tickets to these things because it is unbelievable. The sound is nothing like what you hear on TV. The, and and I, it was notable to me, and I, I'm sure it was a solid rocket booster, this popping noise that you do, you just don't hear it on TV. But the, the pressure, the way it hits your body, it looked like those people yeah. with the jet plane a minute ago. Yeah. You just, and you're sitting there looking at a building. that how, how, how tall would that be in stories, ballpark? Do you know? So uh, about 30 stories. When 30 you see a 30-story story building. Well, the building itself is, is about like 36 stories. Yeah. But the when rocket's you, about the actual 30. Rocket, but yeah. when you see a building that tall, yeah. just take off and start flying. I mean, it just messes. Something that big should not take off. Yeah. You have all this fire and smoke and sound. I mean, it is, it, it's the ultimate fireworks show. It and, is. And it's so cool. And I would encourage anybody, if you get a chance, you're probably not going to get to this first one, trust me, uh, it's not easy to get to, uh, yeah. that uh, you need to go see it. because. And I know a lot of people have condos and visit Cocoa Beach and all that area down there because you get to see so many launches, but it is just breathtaking. It is, and, and the feeling that you get in your chest, you can feel the, oh, yeah. the vibration. It's absolutely amazing. And that space shuttle, what I'll tell you is, that's a firecracker compared to what you're going to feel on this one. It's unbelievable. Kill Eight point eight. Well, let me give you an example. I'm a classic. Uh-huh. I'm a classic car guy. Mm-hmm. So, if you com- compare this to the to, from a horsepower standpoint, it would take 160 thousand Corvettes to equal what this does. Well, that my that number. I got, <laughs> I got to rest on that number a minute. 160 thousand. 160 thousand. It would stretch from Birmingham, Alabama, nose to tail. All the way down to Cocoa Beach, Florida. No. Yes, absolutely. David. That's a lot of juice. Man, that's a that's lot. That's a lot of it juice, it's baby. Un, it's un, and I'm a classic car guy, you know. Um, what I'd take, now it'd be a few less Pontiacs because Pontiacs are better than Corvettes. <laughs> <but yeah. laughs> that's good. David, are you, are you going to be at the launch or will you be, yeah, I'll be watching it be, from your job no, somewhere I will else? be in firing room too. I'm on uh-huh. the mission management team uh-huh. and I'll be one of the folks in there making a call on whether we launch or not. Uh, we'll be looking at the data. Um, you know, oh, you, my, you're the guy when they run the list, you say, go, I'm one of them. Absolutely. And so what I'd tell you is, uh, you know, my team is responsible not only for the engineering and integration 
of all of the components of this vehicle, we write the software. The brains that flies the rocket where it's going is developed in my office. And so um, we, we get to make the call on whether everything is, is ready. Now, we have a launch director, Charlie Blackwell-Thompson. She's an amazing launch director. And she'll be running the ground infrastructure portion of this. And then me and my team and my boss will be making the call from the SLS standpoint. All right, tell me this. Are we ready to go? We're ready. Is this going to happen? So, yeah. And so uh, I think I think the odds are really high we're going to launch in this first window. Now, I will tell you, we're we're subject to God's weather, right? Sure, mm-hmm. sure. Um, you don't want to launch this thing in a thunderstorm when we have a chance for lightning or whatever. And so we watch the weather. We have weather officers. We watch it very carefully. The rocket's going to be ready to launch. You, you mentioned lightning. Uh, it, I, I noticed in the early days, we didn't do it like the Russians did that had the towers around the launch pad, but we do that now. That yeah. that appears to be a better way to uh, dissipate the charge that might bring a lightning strike yeah, we, down, doesn't it? We have a system set up down there now that, in essence, tries to take that lightning to ground if it gets anywhere near the vehicle. You know, during the shuttle days, we had several launches that were scrubbed because we had lightning strikes, and we had to go off and analyze if the vehicle still ready. Um, we still have that type of thing, but it's more automated now. We're able to measure the field strength of the lightning and understand what we're qualified to and all that. So we have a much better system today um, than we did back then. I think in a time, especially in our country, uh, the space program did a great job. You know, the 60s were a very uh, divisive time in our country, and I think the space program did a lot to bring us together. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, there's a lot of similarities now, and I think that you guys can – are going to be a source of great national pride when we get this thing flying again. Well, you know, you're always more successful when you come together with a common goal. And and this can be a common goal that we can all rally around. Um, and it's going to help us. It's going to help our kids. It's going to help our grandkids. And that's really what it's about. It isn't just about going to the moon or going to Mars. It's about developing technologies that help us in our present life and help our kids and grandkids in the future. So tell me, I, 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 th- I think about, I'll use this example because it was such a moment, you know, you think about as a country and it was involving sports. And you think about when, you know, our hockey team beat the Russians uh, in the 80s. And, and you know, you, you think for all of us that were watching that, there was this. You remember how you felt? Oh yeah, I, I, I did, Feel, I, I, I mean, euphoric. We're from, we're from the yeah. south. We don't even care about hockey, <laughs> but, but 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 we're excited. But understanding what <laughs> happened, you know, with with something as you know as, as silly as a sports team, it was a moment where you know we were all very very excited, and it did bring the country together. Uh, you know, like you're talking about with one thing that we were all celebrating together, and politics aside, and all that. But I, I think to myself, as as the way it felt for us, or even people in the actual arena, none of us could understand what it felt like for them. And so I say that to you. As incredible as a rocket launch is for Bubba and for people that watch it and those of us that are watching it on TV, can you explain what it's like for you yeah. to actually have worked on all the the technology and everything it takes that moment that one lifts off? It is, it's a sense of pride yeah. that, that you did something other than get up and go into work every day or whatever. And I tell people all the time, um, my job does not occupy me. I occupy my job. Mm. And so I'm a human, yeah. right? And, and so I have emotions. And, I, and even though I work with some of the smartest people in the world, they have the same thing. So we feel a sense of pride and we recognize we look to those that came before us. You know, I use my dad as an example. There's not a smarter engineer in the world to me. And he's still in this world with us, you know. Mm-hmm. And so for me to be able to participate in something similar to what they did is a real sense of pride. Mm-hmm. And I think it should be a sense of pride for our country. Um, it's not easy, right? Cheating gravity is tough. When we do that, how many other countries have gone to the moon? I can show you, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. They, they might, they might have sent a satellite up right. there. They haven't been on it. They haven't occupied it. Hadn't come back. That's right. And we're talking about taking that next step and going deeper and occupying the moon. Like, God, that's amazing to me. You know, and I, I, I sit outside at night sometimes, and you look up and you see the vastness of this universe, and you wonder what's out there, right? And this is an opportunity for us to do something meaningful and go look. 
So let's come back. We'll finish up. We've got another 10 minutes uh, with David as we walk through this next step in, in our history. Uh, and as you've talked about, Bubba, we just have something innate in us that we must go, we must know. And uh, we'll talk more about that when we come back on this edition of Rick and Bubba University, the podcast. This is the Rick and Bubba Show. Watch more at blazetv.com slash Rick and Bubba. Rick and Bubba, Rick and Bubba. So David Beeman is our guest. Bubba, we only have about 10 more minutes uh, with him before this edition will be done, but it's been fascinating. David, tell us a little bit about the number of people involved in NASA in this project because NASA has facilities all over the country and they do different things. Tell us a little bit about who all is involved to get this thing together and, and flying. Okay. And I'll start with local, Alabama. We have about 15,000 people that are directly working within this environment, trying to get us back to the moon and deeper. And so, and it's a significant investment in this state. Mm -hmm. And, and the one thing that's neat to me is for every one civil service job that is created for this, you have 21 jobs created on the periphery, Mm. which is amazing. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so that if you look at nationwide, you're talking 28,000 people at some level that are involved in this. And the investment that the American people are making in this is to benefit all of us, right? So um, about 45 states are involved, 1,100 different companies. So that's amazing in itself if you think we don't just go get in a room and do this ourselves. It's spread. The environment is spread throughout the country. Right, the opportunities are spread throughout the country. So th- this benefits mankind, not just Huntsville, Alabama, or right. North Alabama. It, it it benefits our entire country, both financially, you know, as well as the technology. I know I, I've seen. I've never visited uh, Stennis, but uh, that's another incredible facility where they test fire a lot of the engines. And I mean, that's just another example of of how this this effort spread out. It in is. a lot of places. It is. And I think about Stennis. Stennis is really important to me because my dad was the one that certified the A2 test stand down at Stennis originally back in the 60s. That was one of his jobs. Wow. And so, and I get an opportunity not only to go down there and see some of the motor firings, but real close to that is Michoud Assembly Facility in New Orleans. You know, we're tied at the hip with both of those facilities with this program. So it's pretty amazing um, just to see a single engine fire. Mm-hmm. And then put four of them on the aft end of that, add two solids. Guys, this is going to be a firework show like you can't imagine. Let, let me ask you about, we'd mentioned earlier some of the private. Are you uh, okay over there? Part, well, I'm tearing up. Yeah, I know. Right. Right. Uh, some of the private partnerships. SpaceX has obviously been uh, in the news a lot with some of their things. The first time you saw a booster come and land itself, did it really give you a strange feeling? I mean, it was so odd to see that. It did. And they've got so good at doing it. It did, and I'll tell you why. So back in the shuttle days, as we got toward the end and and SpaceX was building up, we were helping them. You know, I had the booster. We had ships that recovered our solid rocket boosters. And so we recovered or attempted to recover their first few launches, their first stage boosters. And, and it wasn't as successful as they wanted it to be, right? right? So to go from those experiences to seeing a booster come back and land, whether it be on a platform or on the near the launch pad or whatever, is absolutely amazing. So when, when they had the heavy and two of them, I mean, I was like, I'm like we're watching like, you know, science fiction. Now, what in the world? This is so cool. Uh, one more, I'm going to ask one more question, Rick, and I'll sure. let you ask you. No, sure. And, and you may not can go into all this. You talked about software. Tell us about the programming. What language is that done in, and how does that come about? Okay, so so we have a mixture of computers. Well, now you took my question away. <laughs> all right, Sorry, go buddy. ahead. Pull to Mickey Dean. <laughs> really, we, we really have three different sets of computers on this vehicle. Because of the technology that we're using, the Delta IV Heavy upper stage, and it was already developed, and so you don't want to go change that. So they have some internal software that they develop. Um, and then you have the Orion capsule because it controls the, the, the service module on the way up. So you really have three different systems that interact, which you would think, boy, that makes it real complicated. And then we have three computers on inside the core stage that we control the actual flight path with. And there's minimal exchange between all of those systems. Um, so... It's really unique, and we maintain System Integration Lab, which is in my office in Huntsville, where we are able to take these three different systems 
and have them go through an entire flight like they were up up in space, which is really neat. So you yeah. think about you think about you're able to test like you fly and fly like you test, and that's important. So so the systems lab is real important. Important, okay. So and and you use multiple languages. You have machine language that that in, that's embedded in some of the hardware. That's as ones and zeros, Rick. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, and that's amazing. good. To, and what I'll tell you is, when you're trying to cheat gravity, ones and zeros is the right way to go. <laughs> I either turn or I don't. Right? <laughs> that's right. I, Keep it simple. I either stop or I go. Or what you want it to be a simple. But it's amazing to me when I sit back and I look at these guys and. And the simulation environment they're able to create, like we're in space, like we're flying, test we can test the ground system simultaneous with uh, down in Florida at the same time we're testing the system in Huntsville, and make them all talk back and forth just like they're all sitting on the pad together. That's, that's amazing. That's, that's wild. And you know that's an awesome video game right there, buddy. I'm and telling. back in the '60s, guys, they didn't do that. Okay. And so I, what I tell folks is they were the real pioneers. Okay, they did what hasn't been done. We're trying to perfect what has been done. Let me tell you, seeing what those men and women did. Oh, I know. I mean, just it, it's mind boggling considering what they didn't have access to that now y'all do, like you said, and what they were able to do and pull off is amazing. I mean, those are, those are some pretty uh, impressive minds, <laughs> yeah. you know, coming up with all that. And that now you are still just jumping off all they did. Well, and I laugh. When I think about sometimes the difference between 500 years ago and science and 50 years ago and 100, you know, when Isaac Newton was sitting on the ground and, you know, the old story about the apple falling oh, yeah, on his yeah, head. Right. And he picked up and said, why? I'd pick it up and eat it. I already, <laughs> yeah, I already know why, right? Yeah. So it's yeah, it's different right. today. You're trying to explore different areas. Just further down the road. Yeah. yeah. Some, of, some of our, you know, people ask, are all the laws of physics understood today? Nope. Right. But what I'll tell you is the basis that we use moving forward is understood and understood pretty well. And now we're trying to perfect our understanding of it. Uh, we've only got about three minutes, so it may not be this may not be good to ask you. And it may not be your area. You may just say that. I don't really know that. area. Are we the stuff we're getting back on Mars? Um, uh, is, is this only confirming what you've already said that we think we can get there and we think that we can. Uh, that is a that is not just some pie in the sky dream. We we think we can do it. Yeah, I believe so. And what I tell you is, is is in between the early part of the program when I worked in spacecraft and payload integration, and now I worked in our safety and mission assurance area. And part of that was all of the science projects at Marshall. I was responsible for the safety program for that. So I got to see a lot of the technology and things that mm-hmm. we're getting back. And 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 yeah, it confirms it confirms that we can go there. Um, do we need to know more before we go? Absolutely. Sure. And that's why we have you rovers up there today. never know too much, do you? That's why we have <laughs> rovers up there today, right? But, uh, yeah, um, but I say again, imagine the unimaginable. If you don't want to convince yourself you can't do something like that, you want to convince yourself. I tell people the best way to answer a question isn't no, it's yes, if. Right. right. If you give the yes, if answer, that causes you to go explore the if. What does it take for me to say yes to that question? Right. It goes back to really what we talked about before, and, and I remember the first time I ever heard it. Something, you can't really use the word impossible. Now, you can say we haven't figured out how to do it yet, but it's not impossible. We just got to figure out how to, how to, how to do it. And uh, that, that's a whole different answer than it'll, it can't be done, yes, it, as opposed to we just hadn't figured out how to do it yet. That's two completely different things. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation. It, it really has, yeah. David. Thank you for making time to get here to the studio. And I know you got a lot on your plate right now. Yeah, got, got a few <laughs> things going on, and I know Bub is trying to get in to see the launch. I mean, but it's. Uh, I'm not going to hound you about that. Right, he's not going to get on you about. He w- surely what, you need no, somebody to hold your clip. He wasn't going to get on you about that until he heard it's going to be something like it's never been seen before. It's so, unbelievable. Yeah. So if if he saw a shuttle, I mean that's a, that's what about a six, and this is a ten or. Yeah, this is an 11. You got Bubba. Oh, thanks. I know. David, thanks for being with us. And, and thanks to all of you for being with us on this edition of Rick and Bubba University, the podcast.